Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room would say that you regularly attend the opera? Raise your hand, Dane. Okay, I cheated. I brought my husband, so I knew he was going to raise his hand. According to a report from the National Endowment of the Arts in 2012, 2.1% of the U.S. population attended opera. 2.1%. Now, that number increased pre-pandemic to about 3%. So my point here is that if opera is new to you, you are not alone. But I want you to imagine that you're at an opera. I want you to imagine that you're sitting in an opera house in those plush, velvety chairs. You're listening to an orchestra tune in the pit. You're waiting for the curtain to rise. How do you feel in that moment? What do you picture yourself wearing? Who do you imagine is in that audience with you? Do you see your friends and your family, or do you see a bunch of Mr. Monopoly doppelgangers and ladies in fur coats listening to people in Viking horns sing about Valhalla? Despite the fact that just a small population of people have experienced opera, we collectively share an idea of what opera is and who opera is for. We see opera as being elite and formal, expensive, exclusive, we know just enough about opera to know that it's not really a place where we belong. And this is important to me because where we believe we belong is where we show up. And I believe that you belong everywhere that art is being made. I was a professional opera singer for 10 years, and now I consider myself to be more of an opera hype girl. Like the majority of people, in this country, opera was not a part of my life growing up. Music was a major part of my life. If it was David Bowie and Tina Turner, Whitney, Britney, the Jackson Five, listen, if it wasn't Sondheim, it was Twisted Sister. There was always music going on in my house. But opera wasn't part of the vocabulary. When I was 14, I was doing a musical. And when I say doing a musical, I mean like, ta-da, like I was belting America, and I was trying to convince everyone that I could tap dance, and I surely can't do that. I surely can't. But when the chorus would come in, I would jump up and I would sing the high soprano part. We love a versatile queen, don't we? And after the show, this little old lady comes up to me, and she takes my hand, and she goes, honey, we have got to teach you about opera. Now, I'm in public school. This is not my world. This little old lady at 77 was the first advocate for opera that I met. She became my voice teacher for four years. Her name was Lucy. And Lucy believed in joyful advocacy. She loved to connect the dots. Joyful advocacy is about finding people where they are, meeting them where they are, and bringing them closer to this art form. For me, for a, a kid from public school, opera was a completely foreign, intimidating thing. Every lesson that I had with Lucy, every conversation, was an opportunity to, for her to welcome me in, for her to make it make more sense, for her to demystify this thing that could be intimidating. And that joyful advocacy unlocked my curiosity. I dove so deep into this world that was completely new to me because I had someone who was joyfully advocating for this incredible work. But let me ask you this, have you ever met someone who was an expert in something that you were curious about? And when you go to them with your enthusiasm and your ideas and your questions, they make you feel small or they make you feel foolish for asking questions. How does that change your perception of this thing that maybe you were brand new and really curious about? For most people, it's gonna turn you way off. It's gonna pull you way back. And I see this happen in opera all the time. When I was in graduate school, I was sitting with a group of singers, and we were doing what singers do. We were nerding out hard about our favorite singers and shows and composers. And there was a group of students who were coming in to audition for the school. And as we were talking about what inspired us in opera, one of the young girls says, you know, Phantom of the Opera is really what made me fall in love with opera. And without missing a beat, an upperclassman turns to her and goes, you know, Phantom of the Opera isn't really an opera, right? They use microphones. And also, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember what they said. It was pointless. It was tomfoolery and clownery. I don't support it. Because that was an opportunity for joyful advocacy that instead became an opportunity for ego. 
This person was more interested in showing their superiority, showing that they knew more than in welcoming someone into this. Joyful advocacy is the opposite of ego. Joyful advocacy is about making connections. And I'm gonna tell you, Andrew Lloyd Webber, my dude, if you ever see this, I need you to know, from my heart of hearts, thank you. Because when you gave us Phantom of the Opera, you created a gateway into this art form. Phantom of the Opera allowed generations of people to see themselves in the opera house for the first time, to imagine that it was a space where they belonged. That's a gift. Thank you, ALW, you did it, you crushed it. This lesson really stuck with me. This idea of if someone offers you something, an opportunity to connect, you seize that. When a friend years later was gonna go see her very first opera, she was gonna go see Carmen. She was apprehensive, she was excited, she was nervous. And as a side note, let me say, Carmen is an absolute slam jamma I'm gonna tell you, it's all bops, no skips. It's great music, it's tons of fun, it's a great first opera. But she was gonna go and see this opera and she wanted to know what to expect. And I called upon all of my love and memories to remember the 2001 bop, Carmen the Hip Opera. This might have faded into obscurity for y'all, but I'm telling you, I'm bringing it back. Carmen the Hip Opera was a 2001 MTV movie starring Beyonce, okay? So I'm talking hip hop, I'm talking opera, and I'm talking the queen bee herself. The gateways that this woman has opened for us. Beyonce, if you're watching this, big shout out to you too, baby. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So this friend and I, we talked about the similarities and differences. It's an adaptation. It is strikingly different from the opera. She's not singing in French. It's not the opera but it is a connection point. So she knew the arc of these characters. She understood the relationships and she felt empowered to go into the opera house. She knew she had a place there and all that it takes is joyful advocacy. Now, I tend to get a lot of the same questions from people who are gonna attend their first opera. And I get these questions from everyone, from CEOs to students. I get them from people in the South, from the coasts, from the Midwest. People are concerned with the same core three things. I don't know what to wear to the opera. People ask me this because they say, I don't have anything fancy enough. I don't have anything expensive. We picture that scene in Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts and he snaps the, no, I don't have like the heart of the ocean. I don't have a bunch of diamonds that I can throw on. But when you go to the opera, the point is not to wear the fanciest thing that you own. The point of the opera is to wear something you wanna be seen in. You're supposed to wear something that makes you feel dope, that makes you feel confident, that makes you feel beautiful. You're supposed to wear something that you wanna take pictures of all night. You wanna know why? Because it is an opportunity, because it is an experience to go to the theater. So whether you're like me and it's a polka dot ball gown with purple Converse sneakers, or if you wear a pair of overalls you bedazzled yourself, I want you wearing something that you're proud of when you go to the opera. That is my simple rule. People will also ask me, how will I understand the story if it's in another language? Now, if we go to an opera, chances are good it's gonna be in French, in German, or in Italian. There are also operas, lots of them, in English, in Spanish, in Mandarin. There's definitely one in Klingon. Do not ask me to sing you an excerpt, I cannot. But you're probably gonna see an opera in Italian, French, or German. How am I gonna understand the story if it's in another language? Side note, do you know that according to Netflix's own user data, 80% of people who watch Netflix watch it with captions on, 80%. And that's if they're watching something in English or in a language they don't speak, right? 80%, fascinating. I was having dinner with a group of friends and we were talking about opera, shocking. Opera hype girl, that's what I'm always talking about is opera. And this friend says at this dinner party, Carrie Ann, how am I gonna understand the story if it's in another language? And I said, don't worry, babe, we got super titles. And he goes, cool. And the conversation went on and everyone went back to doing what they were doing. And later he comes up to me, sneaks. And he says, I don't know what super titles are. It's a question of using language that is accessible because all that I had to do was say to that friend, oh my guy, it's just like, you know, when you watch uh, Netflix and you got the subtitles on, these are super titles, so they're just above the, the stage. You've got English translations projected the whole time. The way that we talk about opera is either an access point or 
we create this gatekeeping. We continue this idea of gatekeeping in the arts. Always look for that connection point. And again, joyful advocacy leads to curiosity. It leads to people coming and asking you questions and saying, I don't understand what you meant by that. Can you explain it? That's what advocacy is all about. How am I supposed to act at the opera? How am I supposed, it is two to three hours and I'm sitting there, what am I doing? People will ask me this all the time because you don't want to stand out like a sore thumb. You don't want to laugh at the wrong time, react at the wrong time. And I am here to tell you, again, we keep it simple at the opera. My rule at the opera is that I want you to be present. I want you to turn off your phone and anything that tethers you to the outside world, anything that distracts you. And for two hours, I want you to watch a group of people make art for you live. I'm talking about hundreds of people making art for you live. I'm talking about singers on the stage and the orchestra full of instrumentalists and people in the wings and the costume designers and the set designers and the lighting designers. I'm talking about watching people make art for you. We live in a society where we feel connected because of these phones, and I'm telling you the only real connection is to be in a room with other people like we're doing right now. To make eye contact, to feel. That's what opera allows you to do. So be present. And that means if you see something funny, you laugh. And if you see something shocking, you gasp. And when it's time to clap, you clap with everything that you have in you because that is the opportunity to show these artists our appreciation, our gratitude, and our respect. You are as much a part of the opera experience as the singers on stage. Your reactions are as valid and as important as what's happening on the stage. Now, I wanna share with you my very favorite person to go to the opera with, and that is my dad. That's my dad. Um, so that's Gil. We call him Gilbo Swaggins, hell of a guy. Um, when my dad told me he was gonna come and see the opera, he asked me, what do, you want, what do you want me to wear? I'll wear a suit, oh, I'll wear a suit. I said, you know the rules, dad. You wear what makes you feel great. You wear what you wanna be seen in. And my dad said, I wanna be seen in my ref's outfit. I don't know if you can tell, there's a little referee on his hat. My dad is a referee and he wanted everyone in the opera to know it. What you can't see is he's also in sweatpants. Mwah, iconic. So me in my polka dot ball gown and this man in his sweats, comfortable, confident, present. That's what it's all about. It's not about wearing the most expensive thing that you have. It's about wearing what makes you feel good, what you want to be seen in. That sweet man embodies that. When my dad was coming to see Traviata, he said to me, how will I understand the story? And I said, it's the same story as Pretty Woman and Moulin Rouge. It follows the same kind of arc. So just like with that Carmen the Hip Opera, my dad said, okay, well, I understand these characters and I understand these relationships. It is as simple as that. We don't need to talk down or dumb down. We need to connect. How do I behave in an opera? Now, this, this man, if, I, if he was here right now, the scene he would cause, my dad, <laughs> has an opera voice without having a uh, pitch. You know, he can't like sing in tune, but he's, he can really project, my guy. When I was a junior in college, I was doing a recital. And in a recital, you sing sets of music and then people clap. You sing another set, maybe three or four songs and people clap again. But no one told my dad that was a mistake. I acknowledge that. So after I, I walk out in a dress that I had saved up for the whole semester, and I sing my first piece, and I put my head down to get ready to sing the second, and I am nervous and excited. I'm ready, but I'm scared. And I hear from the back of the room, Bravo! That's my girl! And I taught him that. That's, I regret nothing. Bravo, brava, bravi, my dad's got those down pat. And the audience starts laughing. And my mom goes over and gives him a little swat, and she says, Gil, you gotta wait till the end of the set to clap. But I, as the artist on stage, breathed this sigh of relief because it made us all connected and present. It was a fun moment. Art is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be pretentious and stuck up. It's supposed to be a chance for us to connect. My dad embodies joyful advocacy. He knows this much about opera, but he is a joyful advocate for it. And that's what I hope all of you will be. 
because where we believe we belong is where we show up. So please, show up at the opera.